Policy, Finance, and Elections Committee. I'll call the meeting to order, today being Wednesday, February 10th, 2021. Uh, another great day in Minnesota. And we have three very important bills before us today. And uh, the first item on our agenda will be uh, Senate File 213, uh, authored by Senator Abler. So Senator Abler, welcome to the committee. I'll move Senate File 213, and you can go ahead and present your bill, Senator Abler. Thanks, Madam Chair. And it's uh, it's actually something we worked on last year, too. And I want to thank my co-authors, uh, which are pretty many, uh, Senator Benson, Senator Rosen, Senator Housley, and, uh, and you, Madam Chair. Uh, the point of the bill is simply uh, that if you're a professionally licensed person in Minnesota and there's some kind of issue with a COVID uh, discussion or with a COVID infraction, that the board cannot pile on them. Uh, this came up particularly true with the hair salons. Uh, there was a concern that as they were opening or considering opening and trying to decide what the rules were that the, that the uh, Board of Cosmetology and, uh, was uh, maybe going to be kind of heavy handed. That's where this came from. But, uh, and so this bill is actually very narrow in its focus. It doesn't take on the discussions about whether the executive order is valid or not, but it, it says if you were dinged on that, then that's as far as you can go and the board should just worry about your credentialing, your, uh, your ethical status, about taking good care of your clients, you know, your infection control procedures, and all the professional things that boards are to do and not to go on to be a secondary uh, punisher of any uh, possible infraction. That's, and Madam Chair, there's actually an amendment that Ms. James uh, put together and it would be appropriate if somebody wanted to move that. I, I'll move Senate File 213, Amendment uh, A1 to Senate File 213. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it actually just clarifies uh, it takes out some of the superfluous executive order numbers and just says if they violated an executive order, the board can't uh, take an action. So it's actually much cleaner. And I want to thank her for her help on that. Yes, we do appreciate Ms. James. Uh, Ms. James, you have a comment for us? Uh, Madam Chair and members, I just wanted to note that uh, we need to fill in a blank on the amendment that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, this would be, and we can do this orally and then you can move the oral amendment along with the paper amendment um, as, one amend as one motion. This would be on line 1.3. Ms. James, is that on the A1 amendment? Madam Chair, yes, that's right. Okay. In the, replace the blank with violation of executive orders during a peacetime emergency. Okay, members, um, I'm gonna have Ms. James repeat that just to be sure we all have it since it's an oral amendment. Madam Chair and members, on page one, line three, delete the blank and insert violation of executive orders during a peacetime emergency. Thank you very much. Ms. James, I really appreciate that. And members, this is a delete everything after the enacting clause. So it's basically taking the title from the original bill uh, section one area and putting it into the delete all amendment. So members with that, we have um, the oral amendment to the A1 amendment. We'll take this as one motion. Again, I move um, A1 amendment to Senate file 213. Uh, please unmute everybody. All those in favor say aye. Aye, aye. aye. All those opposed? Motion prevails. The A1 amendment as amended is adopted to Senate file 213. Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And thanks to Ms. James for making a, a good bill even better. Um, I, I hope this, uh, at the end of the day, I hope this actually can become law. So at this point, I'll stand for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. Members, do you have questions? Well, Senator Abler, it looks like you are um, in a question-free zone today, yeah. and we appreciate your being available. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there being no uh, additional questions being asked at this time, 
Um, I will move Senate file 213 as amended to be recommended to pass and to be referred to general orders. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Madam Senator. Chair, Would I think you like it maybe should comments? go to Senator Benson's committee because uh, there's Department of Health involved as well in some of these licenses. So I'm Just totally happy with that. Does, that, does Ms. James agree? I, I believe that would be correct. Uh, Senator Abler, let's give us just a moment here to check sure. on that because that's not what we were informed, so. Oh, okay. Um, I don't mind going there, Madam Chair, if I have to. You don't mind going to HHS? Right, I don't mind there. I, or you don't mind going to general orders, Senator? I, uh, I'm, I'm actually very fine to go to the to HHS, and then if it's not necessary, we could simply move it by motion. But um, I just, if unless somebody knows the contrary, I, I think that it's important to let everybody have a crack at it. So, I appreciate that, Senator Abler. Uh, we're checking on it. Senator Fate, did you have a question? Meantime, yes, Senator Coran, you're unmuted, so some of your background noise is coming through. Thank you, mm -hmm. Senator Fate. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I had a question for uh, Senator Abler. Um, so on this, what impact would the legislation have uh, on the mask mandate? So if a business was operating without enforcing masks, uh, what recourse uh, would the state have under this proposal? Senator uh, Abler. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Fate. It would have all the recourses it has now. Uh, it have the power of the Attorney General, the Department of Health, and whatever penalties the executive order might carry. Uh, but this just says it can't be a professional infraction based upon your license to cut hair or do uh, whatever field you're in. So there is, I, I believe there's pretty ample uh, punitive measures available at, uh, that the state has, but this just keeps the professional license separate from that topic. Thank you, Senator Abel. I think that is a very, very important um, consideration. Senator Fate, does that answer your question? If it does, please lower your hand, then I'll know you've gotten that taken yes, care of. Yes, I'll lower my hand, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> I know. Um, just a moment, do we got an answer on that? Yeah. Okay, Senator Abler, it does not have to go to HHS. Ms. James has communicated with okay. us, it does not have to. I'm happy to go to the consent calendar, Madam Chair, but I'll settle <laughs> for the floor. Thank you. All right. We won't push our luck on that, Senator Abel. I think no. general orders would be a good first step. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that, members, uh, I will move again to refresh our minds. Uh, Senate file 213, as amended, to be recommended to pass and be referred to general orders. All right, members, on that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, unmute aye. yourself. Please unmute yourself. Uh, all those opposed? No. Motion. No. Okay. Motion prevails. I mean, the uh, motion prevails. It's about 213. is on its way to general orders. Thank you, members. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Appreciate the, the consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, um, the next bill on our agenda is Senate File 587. And Senator Tomasoni, we are very glad to have you at State Gov Committee today. Welcome to our committee. And so, uh, Senator Tomasoni, do you want to uh, introduce your bill first? And then you also have an amendment. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you very much for hearing this bill. I, I truly appreciate it. And um, this is a, a bill requiring that layoffs of state employees be geographically distributed. And so I, I'll get into that in a minute, but I think, Madam Chair, since the A4 amendment is a delete all amendment, that maybe mm -hmm. we better off uh, putting the amendment on as, and so working off the bill as intended, if, if it pleases the committee. Is the essence of the um, subject of the A4 amendment is the same as your bill, is that correct? If Madam Chair, it would replace the bill. Yes, it would be the yeah. it, it would be the bill that we work off of then. All right. So, members, um, I'll move the A4 amendment to Senate File 587. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Same sign, motion prevails and the A4 amendment is adopted to Senate file 587. And with that, Senator Tomasoni, we will uh, have you go forward and present your bill and then members, there are some uh, testifiers that we have as well. And uh, we'll also have time for member questions. So with that, Senator Tomasoni, go ahead and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. So. Uh, Senate file 587 comes to us as a result of what happened uh, last year in the Department of Corrections. And um, we have a couple of very, very effective uh, corrections facilities in, in Togo and Willow River, which have a, a very, very good um, rate of uh, uh, curbing recidivism and making people that come to those facilities um, very productive members of society when they get out. And we also have about 150 to 180 jobs in those two facilities, which are very uh, good paying jobs. And they're the types of jobs that have uh, people have had for 15 or 20 years. In fact, I, I got a, a ton of emails from, from employees who told me that they had lived there for 15 years and worked there for 15 years. And they're part of the uh, program that uh, is is working so well in these facilities and that they didn't want to have to uh, pull up roots and move and go somewhere else because they were um, they were they were very very satisfied with what they were doing and they were afraid of what might happen had they gone somewhere else and and what ended up happening was there was a, a, a perceived uh, reduction in the budget at DOC and so DOC decided to close both facilities and essentially lay off all of these people and so what the what the bill does is it says that in the in the event of um, an anticipated budget deficit at one of the agencies, that uh, instead of uh, targeting uh, a couple of places in rural Minnesota, which uh, we 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 also need to add that um, really good paying jobs like these in rural Minnesota are not that easy to come by. Um, so the, the the impetus of the bill is to not target one or two facilities in, in rural Minnesota, but to, but to spread the personnel uh, reductions across the entire system. And so um, it, it, that's, the, that's the essence of the bill, Madam Chair. And I think if you uh, could turn it over to a couple of testifiers, you can, you can get, a, get some people on the grounds, actual uh, impetus or input from them. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni, we'll do that. So um, our first testifier on our list today is Mr. Danucci from the Itasca County Commissioners. And welcome, Mr. Danucci. We're glad to have you here today. Uh, for the record, um, please state your name and your title, and then you can go ahead and give your testimony, Mr. Danucci. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Ben Danucci, and I'm the Itasca County Commissioner District 5, the home of MCF Togo. I'm pleased to be able to share with you why we feel this program and these jobs are so important to us. Let me start by saying MCF Togo should be invested in and expanded, not threatened from time to time as it has been in years past. We think offenders should be ruled in automatically and then ruled out instead of having to qualify to get in. The reason I say that is the program works. As Senator Tomasoni uh, stated, there is a reason why the recidivism statistics are better coming out of this program as compared to the rest of the system. When you ask the men and women doing this life-changing work day in and day out, they will tell you our rural location is key. They will tell you that this work cannot be duplicated inside the fence of a large city. It's just not the same as the therapeutic benefit of working in nature. And there are benefits that are also recognized by our local communities. Last year, MCF Togo worked for 18 different organizations, including cities, townships, tribal government, Itasca County, school districts, the Salvation Army, and the Minnesota DNR. Specifically as it re relates to the DNR, MCF Togo stepped up and created a contract to maintain eight area campgrounds and lake accesses. Had this not been done, these campgrounds that bring thousands to the area, contributing to our local economy, would have been closed permanently due to financial constraints by the DNR. Okay, so those are the benefit examples. Let's talk about the jobs. These are good paying, family sustaining jobs in our area, an area where jobs like these are hard to come by. Itasca County relies heavily on timber, taconite, and tourism. 
This year, large anchor employers temporarily ceased operations and laid off 525 employees at the Blandon UPM Paper Mill in Grand Rapids and the Keytac Taconite Mining Facility in Keewatin. An international company with a manufacturing facility in Big Fork by the name of E2IP Technologies announced back on May 13th the location will be closed and permanently dislocate 59 manufacturing employees. This is a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic and the company's decision to consolidate its operations to its headquarters in Canada. I can keep going. Itasca County has experienced economic adjustment problems as coal powered electricity generation is phased out. The Clay Boswell coal fired power plant in Coasa permanently decommissioned two units in December of 2018 and permanently eliminated 57 jobs at the plant. An economic impact analysis conducted by the University of Minnesota estimated another 47 indirect job losses as a result. In addition, as many of you know, there is continued pressure to decommission the rest of the plant with a tremendous impact, tremendous impact on workforce and tax capacity. So in closing, MCF Togo represents critical family sustaining positions in rural Minnesota, outside our core industries. People that work at MCF Togo, they own the nice houses in town. They drive new, new trucks. They're members of the fire department. Their children go to, their children go to our schools. They're the best example of diversifying our rural economy to sustain through economic downturn. Thank you, and I will stand for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Danucci, Commissioner Danucci. Um, well spoken on those three very important areas. Uh, I toured uh, when we were on the Capital Investment Committee. It is an impressive location, an impressive result. Uh, and we're very grateful for what they do also for the folks that you take care of there and see them go into a better future. That's, that's what we all want, uh, to have another chance to do better at life. Thank you very much. With that, we will have our next uh, testifier, uh, Ms. Hansen, uh, corrections officer from, also from Togo representing AFSME, but I am uh, giving you opportunity here. Uh, Ms. Hansen, if you might go ahead and again, state your name and title for the audio record and then go ahead and uh, give your testimony, Ms. Hansen. I can't quite see her on the screen. Does has anybody, is she on the phone or having trouble getting in at all? Give us just a moment. Uh, Senator Tomasoni, you probably have um, some connections uh, or Mr. Danucci. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll certainly, um, if she comes on, uh, we'll include her testimony uh, as soon as she does come. With that, we will then go to um, our next testifier, Deputy Commissioner Kristen Batson. Uh, Ms. Batson, welcome to State Government Committee. We appreciate your being here today. Again, for the record, state your name and title, and then you can proceed and give your testimony, Ms. Batson. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Kristen Batson, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Enterprise Human Capital with Minnesota Management and Budget. And here today to uh, speak to Senate File 587. Agencies that are facing budget deficits face difficult decisions to ensure that operations can be maintained within their appropriated budgets. Um, and we first saw this bill when the Department of Corrections announced its decision to close its Togo and Willow River facilities due to a significant operating deficit. And the legislature provided supplemental funding to avoid these closures. However, the Department of Corrections came to the table with a plan to live within their budget and that was sensitive to the impacts on employees, which we were all happy to see. We've also seen the need for operating adjustments in direct care and treatment in the Department of Human Services. Um, and again, the legislature ultimately provided the funding needed um, however, the agency reviewed and was prepared to make reductions to ensure that continued services for the Minnesotans who needed them most were available. Agencies with 24 seven operations generally do not have large overhead budgets and most of their budgets do go to staffing. 
So across the board cuts ultimately undermine the integrity, effectiveness, and the safety of the programs that they operate. And these agencies need to have the flexibility to make strategic reductions to ensure the best outcomes for Minnesota. We agree that ensuring opportunities for state employment throughout Minnesota is critically important to ensure services throughout the state and employment throughout the state. But a mandate like this does not allow agencies in these positions to consider uh, nuance. And agencies must um, also be fiscal stewards of the taxpayer's money. And restrictions like this hinder their ability to make sound decisions to ensure accountability, transparency, and the best way to serve our population here in Minnesota. Those are the end of my comments. and. Uh, I'll stand for questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Batson. Thank you for being here today. I'm going to check back if uh, Ms. Hansen is available. Pardon? No. So, Senator Thomasoni, at you. this point, we do not have Ms. Hansen on our connection at all. So, members, why don't we go ahead and go to uh, questions? Questions and we'll certainly, um, if Ms. Panson is able to uh, come forward as we go forward here, Senator Thomasoni will will put that in the line. With that, we can go to member questions and hands up that I see here right now is Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, a comment. Uh, we we spent some time and we've heard about uh, the Department of Corrections in two situations in uh, one area of the state. Uh, as I interpret this bill, this would be for all the uh, state agencies. So it would be transportation, health and human services, higher ed, on and on. And I think there, there are unique needs uh, within our state based upon population, uh, specific needs of facilities, uh, other areas. And I think this would really tie the hands of our state agencies in making appropriate decisions and providing services uh, for Minnesota citizens. So uh, based upon that, I guess I'd like maybe a, a Senator Thomasoni to comment uh, if he would about my comments or I, I just have questions about uh, the flexibility of agencies to really make uh, decisions uh, based upon the needs of Minnesotans. Thank you. Senator Thomasoni. Well, Madam Chair and Senator Claussen, thank you for that because that's exactly what we're trying to make sure that we uh, are part of the decision making in rural Minnesota and not being targeted in rural Minnesota. When you have uh, state jobs in, a, in an area like uh, like Togo or Willow River or the DNR in Hibbing or the, or, or the Revenue Department in Ely, and um, it, it's very easy for an agency to say, let's just shut those jobs down and uh, cut, the, cut the costs that are, that are associated with them without potentially looking across the entire system and saying, if we do a little bit here and a little bit there, we can still achieve the same thing. And I, I believe that, um, that if you have, especially in the, in, the, in the DOC, where they have two programs in Willow River and Togo that are two of the most effective programs that, that they have in the department. And they, they just decide to shut them down because of, because of uh, co potential cost overruns and not consider not only the people that are working there, but also the, the, the effectiveness of the programs, which actually um, have a real low recidivism rate compared to all the rest of the programs in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in DOC and actually put people back into society as, as productive citizens. The, the decision to shut those down just because it's an easy call is not what the, what the agency should be doing. And, and so uh, this bill would actually make each of the agencies take a look at where they have the jobs, what the effect of this is, what they're doing, and try and figure out a way to work with everybody all across the board. In addition, um, you have every one of these agencies has, um, and, we're, and we're doing it right now in this meeting, have the ability to uh, uh, connect over the internet and make decisions over the internet and to uh, make, make their, uh, their, have their employees uh, do jobs, say in Ely that 
could be done in Minneapolis. And, and so uh, at some point in time, if you have that type of flex flexibility because of our technology, then the agency should consider how important these jobs are to small towns as opposed to uh, the, the bigger towns. And I, and I gotta say, if, if you lose a job in, in the Twin Cities, it's much easier to find a new job and stay in your same location than it is if you're living in Ely and you lose your job and you may have to uproot the whole family and move somewhere else. So all of this is intended to make it better for what's going on in our state government. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. Um, I see that we have Ms. McComas um, who was on deck. Um, I think that was uh, at this point has her hand up and is looking to make some comments because we haven't had um, Ms. Hansen come on yet. So uh, Ms. McComas, would you like to go ahead and give some testimony? If you would just lower your hand and then when you do start speaking, just uh, say your name and title for the audio record and then go ahead and give your testimony, Ms. McComas. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My name is Tiffany McComas and I work at MCF Togo. I have worked for the state of Minnesota for over 11 years. Um, my decision to speak was a hard decision to speak today, but I'm doing it because of the support my coworkers and I received from the community, from elected officials and our loved ones. Related to the closure that we were informed in August of 2020. Um, when I received the news, it was, I was stunned. Um, this isn't the first time at MCF Togo. I have, and I have worked at a couple other places before I transferred to MCF Togo. And there was days where I was crying because I didn't know what was gonna happen. Because if I go anywhere, it's at least two hours, but, um, when I got the layoff notice, the closest job for me was over three hours. And my husband has been working for the state for over 26 years. And he, he's, not, he's not at the point where he could retire either. And we have a young child. So this was really a hard thing for us. It was a lot and, and keeping I'm sorry, it's just, it's really hard for me to talk about because of what I all went through. Um, there was days I came to work in tears, like I said before. And when I got my layoff notice, which was at the beginning, I believe in October, I was supposed to go um, up north to get ready for deer season. And I couldn't even leave. I had to stay home because I, I was, I didn't want to answer any questions from people, especially when I had, we're dealing with working with our peers, my peers and that. I know it sounds, and I know that sounds really, maybe some people don't understand, but what happens if we leave here? That means we find new doctors. That means that um, there's not, we're not using the doctors up here anymore. We are not there for schools, just like um, Danucci was talking about. I had, to, I had to find a new daycare. And at that time, my child wasn't even one years old. Wasn't even one years old. And when we're looking, my husband and I were looking at where we might have to go, how, and about housing and everything, what we could afford. And we had just bought a house in the last few years. So that, and so we have a house payment and then we have to go find another place to live. Costs. And I know that some of my peers, they said they would just go on welfare. So that's not even gonna help the county. And I, and I understand a little bit about how this might affect other areas. 
but this program, the staff here, they're here to stay. There's only two people that left due to this. And one's because they didn't even have a year in. So they, they were worried that they were gonna be out and they had no benefits, nothing. So they were looking for something because they're the breadwinner of that family. Um, so I really want you guys to think about is what it does because I'm just not a state worker and I know this might affect other state workers and maybe in the metro area. But when you, when you guys make decisions, I really want you guys to think about, I'm just not a state worker. I'm a mom, I'm an aunt, I'm a granddaughter, I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, a wife, um, I'm a vet. I'm so much more than a state worker. And I just hope that when you look at this bill and see what it can do for the community on these that don't live in the cities and how this can affect your own loved ones too, indirectly or directly, because I can see the benefits of this bill, but I can understand why some people have concerns, but we got to think what's best for the community. And I really hope that this comes out to help the smaller communities, the businesses for the state workers that live out in these smaller communities, because it's really hard to find another job if we don't have this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. McComas. Uh, uh, excellent telling of your story and the impact to your family, and especially in a rural situation where if you were in the metro, there are many jobs around you that you could take, but in this particular rural setting, and in many of them, that is not the case. So it really matters a lot. Senator Tomasoni, um, the legislature, um, I believe, did not make the decision to close Togo or Willow River. Senator Tomasoni, who did make the decision to close those two? Senator Tomasoni. Madam Chair, it's my understanding that came from DOC. Department of Corrections made the decision. I would assume they would also have consulted with the governor on that, Senator Tomasoni. I that, that I guess you would have to ask Ms. Batson on that one, Madam, Madam Chair. Okay. Ms. Batson, did you consult uh, the governor in regards to the decision for Togo and Willow River closing? Uh Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I was not personally involved in those uh, conversations and those decisions, so I, I couldn't answer that, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Batson, could you get the answer for us so we can know? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McComas. Uh, Ms. Hansen will not be testifying, we, she, whatever happened here, but at least now we know and, and uh, we can, um, proceed with the rest of our committee work. Uh, with that members, um, we've uh, completed our testifiers open for questions and I see Senator Carlson, you have your hand up. Senator Carlson, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess what I need is some comfort language here. Uh, um, Senator Tomasoni, uh, have you thought about the, wide, uh, the wider issue of unintended consequences? Um, I think what we found in the last, uh, you know, since this issue came up, uh, that the Togo in Willow River has some tremendous achievements. And like you mentioned about uh, recidivism is greatly reduced. And Mr. Danucci said that we need to expand these programs uh, and uh, do this good, you know, in a wider sense. And I'm concerned that uh, if we have something that uh, binds the hands of the Department of Corrections or the state, uh, does that uh, enter into a decision that we may never even know about to expand a greater Minnesota program like this because the it, it may uh, cause a problem if we have another um, widespread cut in funding and that cut in funding is, uh, is going to affect uh, uh, the decisions on where those kinds of of programs are placed. That's one. And then the other one is uh, if we do cut in another location that might be, uh, let's say the other side, you know, the, the uh, you know, suburban metro, 
middle Minnesota um, programs, does that mean that Togo might be under some kind of requirement to have a like cut of, of people? I wanna make sure that we do the right thing, not only for the employees, but also for the people that we're helping with those kinds of programs in greater Minnesota. And I do wonder you know, if what uh, Senator Claussen said that this um, tying the hands of our, our agency to make decisions either to expand or to reduce might be an un unintended consequence of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam, Thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Carlson, I, I, I don't think there's any consequences of expansion because in the event of expansion, I would think that there's enough money to do it and that the particular agency that's doing the expansion has calculated that. Um, the, the whole idea here would be, look, you get 150 people working in these two uh, facilities. And so the, the cut of these 150 people results in $14 million in savings for DOC. Well, you know, how about keeping the programs going and cutting 125 and finding across the neck the other seven or eight prisons in the, in the state some, uh, some economies of scale that can save some money for the, for the whole thing. And, and so I, we're, just, we're just trying to make this fair. And, and the agencies have the ability to make that kind of a calculation and figure out where, it's, where, where, where the best uh, savings are. And in fact, they might find out that they can, they can have some savings in other areas rather than cutting employees, which might be pretty interesting. But, it, but if, it's, if it's just too easy to shut down a couple of facilities and cut a, cut a number of jobs, then I think that... Uh, we are doing a disservice not only to the programs themselves, but to the people working there and the beneficiaries of the program. And I, I believe that the agencies uh, could maybe make it some kind of an internal audit and figure out maybe a little bit better way to go. So I, I, I hope that this will actually turn into a positive thing, uh, Senator Carlson, as opposed to uh, worrying about whether or not we're going to be negative. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. I understand that uh, Ms. Batson has some information for us. Ms. Batson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, I do uh, have information uh, in regards to your last question about whether the Department of Corrections um, had discussed uh, the facilities for closure with the governor's office. Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Thank you, Ms. Batson. Uh, next uh, person on my list here is Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Senator Tomasoni, I just want to get a sense of, of the scope of the bill. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about corrections, and I've got the uh, uh, women's correction facility, the only uh, women's corrections facility in the state. When you talk about balancing, let me just ask, so let's say there was a reduction in corrections. Could that be offset by uh, an, uh, let's say an outstate uh, reduction in corrections, could that be offset by a metro uh, reduction in, uh, let's say, MnDOT? Uh, or does it have to be an agency by agency balance? Uh, it's, it seems like the executive branch has some flexibility in your bill language with the, with the amendment, and I just want to get your intent. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Tomasoni, as to that point. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Pratt. Each executive branch state agency must make personnel reductions so that the ec economies of the state outside of the metropolitan area. It looks to me like it would be internal re in, uh, reductions, but I would not be adverse to um, potentially making it so that the various agencies can interact with this, uh, as you're suggesting, uh, Senator Pratt. But I think the way the bill's written, it would be each internal agency, and maybe Ms. James can help me on that. Uh, Ms. James, considering the discussion, might you have a recommendation for Senator Tomasoni to amend uh, according to his wishes? Ms. James? Um, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Tomasoni and members, um, I don't have a recommendation yet for how you would change it. I just wanted to clarify that the 
um, structure matches the original bill, which is applies to each executive branch state agency. And I think as Senator Thomasoni described, that would mean that each agency on its own, um, according to the language on the paper, um, would do its own balancing. Um, and the language doesn't provide for um, spreading it out across agencies. So we would need to work on something to accomplish that. Ms. James, I have a question for you. If we continue our discussion here for a little bit, might that give you the time needed to do this during committee right now? Um, Madam Chair, I will, I will work on it. I'll work on it with Senator Thomasoni. I, I'm not sure exactly how long you're going to go or how long it will take us, um, but we'll do what we can do. And, and Madam Senator Chair. Senator Thomasoni. Me, I, um, when I think about that, what, ha what happened in this particular situation was that the Department of Corrections uh, was concerned about uh, revenues not being up to what they needed them to be in order to keep uh, all their facilities running at, at the level that the budget had ori originally anticipated. So this was a, a, uh, a reduction or an anticipated reduction specific to the Department of Corrections. Um, and I think um, to, to Senator Pratt's question and the potential amendment to this bill, um, I, I, we might be onto something that's even better than what the, than what the bill is doing because it would it would it would certainly minimize a real lot of uh, of, uh, of of pain within a specific uh, uh, budget, but at the same time. It, might get really, really complicated. So uh, I, I think, I think that, um, I, I think that. It, Senator Thomasoni, uh, yeah. let me share this with you. It might help out. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, we have another bill on our agenda, okay. and if we just, uh, I'll just, I, I can just lay your bill on the table temporarily. We'll come back to it during committee time, and uh, see what you, Miss James, might be able to do. Okay. And then we'll pick it back up again. Uh, but we really want to try and do committee work. And I think if you just are able to set aside for a moment and focus on that, if that's okay with you, um, okay. we'll just do that. Okay. I appreciate that, Madam Chair. We'll come back to it before the end of this hearing for sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. Senator Howe. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and you know, I just, to, to that point, I prefer the language that you currently have, Senator Tomasoni. I, I, I like it that each agency has to make that decision within, uh, instead of spray, spreading it out through different agencies. I, I think it, it makes each agency responsible for their locations uh, instead of trying to throw the, uh, throw, the, throw the blame on another agency. And I just, I like it the way it is personally, but uh, you do, it's your bill. Sure, oh. you do as you please. Madam, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Thomasoni. How about if we just pass this the way it is and, and I have the discussion with the chair later on and figure out if we can go somewhere uh, differently than, uh, than, than what the bill is now. Because I think, I think Senator Hall is right that it's, we're, we're probably better off letting each individual agency make a decision on this. Uh, potentially, there could be some agencies that have more money than they need and could share. But at the same time, um, it's uh, some of these internal decisions that can get pretty complicated, and maybe it's better off letting each individual agency deal deal with it. So, I'm wondering if maybe just passing the bill of way it is, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. and then having discussions later on would be okay. Uh, Senator Thomasoni, yes, we can do that. I don't think it is um, essential one way or the other, and because this bill is going to general orders, uh, you'll have an opportunity there to take a look at that, consider it, leave it alone, or do something else. Um, considering that, I see that Senator Carlson, Senator Carlson, do you have a question to this point? Yes, th thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, support what uh, Senator Howe just said and also what uh, Senator Thomasoni has as his preference. Uh, I, I still wonder about the unintended consequences because if we're talking about, I mean, let's just take Togo and Willow River out of the discussion that there might be other locations that either could expand or be new in the future. And if there's a problem with uh, trying to balance with other agencies, that could be a problem within even in decision making for bringing these jobs to greater Minnesota. We want to be, be sure that we protect 
the ability to bring jobs to greater Minnesota. And that's where I'm concerned about that uh, unintended consequences. So I, uh, I support what uh, Senator Tomasoni says, let's, let's get this through and then let's figure out what to do with it. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Carlson. I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about that because this is specific to not expanding, it's specific to layoffs uh, in particular, not expansions. Uh, nevertheless, are there any other questions? I, I, what I see here, Senator Tomasoni, is that we will act on the Senate File 587 as amended, and then you can continue having discussions about that. I think this will uh, be a little bit more involved. Anybody else want to weigh in on this at all? Okay, with that members, then we'll proceed to a vote on Senate File 587 as amended. I'll move uh, Senate File 587 as amended to be recommended to pass and be referred to general orders. Members, if you can unmute yourself. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. No. <laughs> All right. Um, the motion passes and Senate file 587 as amended is on its way to general orders. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. So Senator Carlson, you preferred the bill as is, but um, interesting. All right, members, uh, with you. that, we will proceed to, we will proceed to uh, Senate file 299 and Senator Coran as a member of the committee, you can make your motions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move Senate File 299. So moved. And and Madam Chair, I also have uh, an A1 on author's amendment. This is the first stop. So if uh, we could adopt that amendment, and then we can speak to the bill. Go ahead and move your amendment to the bill, Senator. I'd Grant. like to move 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 the A1 amendment to Senate File 20, 299. That's correct. Okay, that is the amendment. It's an author's amendment. Um, all those in favor, members, please unmute. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Uh, the A1 amendment to Senate File 299 is adopted. Senator Coran, thank you, Madam. Bill, as thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll go just to the amendment first. Um, the amendment really brought in, and it was recommended by Ms. James, um, to bring uh, clarity in the scope of the language and the definition of uh, of what the executive branch and the state agencies are, and, and that clearly helps define what they are and what they are not. And so with that, Madam Chair, um, this is a, a, a bill that follows upon uh, you know, a, a bill you had, I think a week ago, or looking at the uh, full-time equivalent of, the, of FTEs that, that exist in the state. And I think yours was to turn back those that left unfilled. And this one um, really looks at how do we try to, to contain the growth of government and protect wallets? Um, there's no measurement of a determination of need when we look out and we've seen the expansion of government time over time or year over year. And in this, what it simply does is, is the growth in our population would have a natural increase in growth and need in a variety of areas. And so what this does is simply ties the growth of FTEs, the growth in state employment, to the percentage of the uh, growth or not to exceed the growth of the uh, previous year um, state determined census or, or not the census, but the demographers stated growth. We've had years in, in the past and, and when we've carried this bill forward, I think I remember a specific testimony by um, Edwin Hudson at the time of MMB that said um, growth, it was a terrible year for state employment growth. And I think his statement was, we grew at 7.4%. And, and at the time that, and he said it was actually constrained because of the lack of resources and they wanted to hire more people or create more jobs and, and bring more people in. At that time, the growth of the population was at seven tenths of 1%. So we had state government growing at 10 times the rate of the population growth. And so there's no correlation. And what this does, it seems very simple ties back to um, and tries to put in some type of gauge that, that is measurable and, and then justifies the growth or tries to contain the growth well beyond the wallets of the citizens of Minnesota. So that's what this bill does, Madam Chair. And, and um, I think we, we have to make sure, and I think, I think we've had testimony from um, uh, or conversations with the uh, prior 
MMB commissioner, um, Mr. Franz, um, that the governor has put on some significant uh, hiring freezes and, and I believe has reduced. I don't think we've seen the totals. We've requested the totals of FTEs for the last three years um, to see what that growth is. And now would be a good time to put that cap in place to make sure that we are fiscally responsible and making sure that we honor every dollar and, and to make sure that government is functioning and we need to be producing more um, with less and, uh, and certainly not growing at 10 times the, the rate of the population um, in, in needs determination. So with that, Madam Chair, I would stand for questions and uh, um, any comments. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Coran. By the way, in the full finance committee this morning, we were informed by the commissioner of MMB that they're in the uh, federal money, there are 355 new FTEs already uh, in that regard. And the concern we have is that, uh, that they will uh, somehow become permanent and uh, contribute to that as well. Would your bill include that sort of scenario? Is it, uh, can you just explain how your bill might interact with that, Senator Grant? Madam Chair, Madam Chair, great question, because that is one of the areas in which, since I arrived, I've done a lot. This is my 38th year, either working in and for government or selling into government. And, and part of my, my goal since I arrived is that we need to, we need to retrain our, our government resources to make sure that we're cross-trained and we understand um, the, the value of a job. Uh, or not the value of the job, but the, the life cycle of the process in which they operate in. Specific to the pandemic, if you look at these 8,000 employees in Department of Human Services and then the Department of Health and Department of Public Safety, where one of their primary responsibilities was to always be prepared for a pandemic. It's a primary responsibility, not a secondary, a primary. One of my proposals was to train all staff and, and, and to the level for emergency backup and everything, um, at the front lines, say in a group home, uh, nursing homes, you've seen the scramble to try and find emergency staff. When we have 8,000 personnel within just the State Department of Human Services and likely another 8,000 in the County Department of Human Services, we have to make sure that those staff are trained to, to the same level that the people who are actually delivering the services on the streets. With that, we would then be prepared to manage pandemics and those things that come about, epidemics or pandemics. Um, in an emergency situation, could there be a temporary? I, I don't think this precludes a temporary. Um, but in this case, I think we would have been well prepared if we would have implemented or started working on four years ago, that training regimen and the certification to make sure that we are prepared for one of the primary responsibilities of those three core agencies. So um, I appreciate the question, Madam Chair. And, and I, I think we, we, because we failed to prepare for those things, we get into the mode in which we're at today. We have to hire outside people. We have to grow and do grow and expand. And yet the outcomes from our citizens are not recognized or realized as being a dramatic improvement of service. In fact, in many cases, they don't see an improvement of service and we just add more resources and the true output is diminished on a year over year basis. Thank you, Senator Coran. Uh, we do have a testifier, um, Ms. Batson, uh, would you go ahead and proceed with your testimony again, even though you've been here before for the committee, but just to make sure for the audio record, your name and title again, Ms. Batson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Kristen Batson and I am the Deputy Commissioner of Enterprise Human Capital at MMB. Uh, and I do have some comments that relate to Senate File uh, 299. Throughout Minnesota, state government services exist to ensure the needs that our citizens are met, that is our top priority. Uh, whether that is ensuring our roads and bridges are safe, there's access to vital social services or support for learning in our schools, colleges and universities. It's a very broad array of services. And we need to have an adequate state workforce to address unprecedented times as well as we've seen. Uh, as we've seen throughout this pandemic, uh, as our state employees have developed grant programs for small businesses uh, and established uh, testing and vaccination sites across the state, all while continuing the core functions of state government. Uh, we need to lead with what our citizens need um, and arbitrarily linking workforce numbers with the state's population uh, is contrary to this notion. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Those are the end of my comments uh, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I guess my question would be to, to Ms. Batson then, um, is there a limit and what would you gauge the need? Um, is, there, is, there, is there any ability to gauge the need? And when you speak of the unprecedented environment, it's only unprecedented when you, when you have not been prepared. So let's look back at 20, 2009. We also had a pandemic. In 2010, did the state start to redirect and make sure to prepare again for one of their core priorities, right? Minnesota Department of Health, Public Safety, and Department of Human Services, one of their primary responsibilities always be prepared. And in this particular case, clearly we weren't prepared. And now we're in the year 2010 of, of the equivalent of another pandemic. And so what have we done? It doesn't look like we've done anything in the last 10 years. And at some point we have to go back and start to make sure that we don't allow this to occur 10 years from today. We have to change how we train and implement policies and procedures that we are prepared to, for emergency um, support teams from Department of Human Services for nursing homes and the critical care facilities. Um, I, I just don't understand, um, and I don't, I don't um, buy into the, to the fact that we are in unprecedented times, but when we, when we fail to prepare, it's far more daunting than it should be. So Thank what would that what would it be that you suggest as a limit to gauge or what what will you be doing from a human resource capital manager to prepare for this when it comes in the future? Thank you, Senator Cran. Ms. Batson. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Cran. Uh, those are excellent questions. And I heard two questions in there, so I'll I'll address them in two parts. Uh, the first thing is uh, what should we consider uh, in thinking about the size of the workforce? Um, and I think there are um, key considerations that uh, relate to uh, budget. Always we want to live within our means. Um, we want to look at legislative mandates uh, that we've been given. Um, and we also want to look at constitutional responsibilities and the key role that, that we depend upon state government for. So um, there's a lot of complex decisions, um, including our relationship with, with the federal government uh, and with other jurisdictions as well and being good partners there. So um, very complicated uh, set of factors, but, but those are some of the considerations that, that we'd look at. Um, the other question I believe related to the pandemic and preparedness uh, and appreciate that question. Uh, this has been a year that has really reminded us of the importance of preparedness. Um, and I just wanna put a plug in for the good work that state employees have done uh, in this year and the preparedness um, we have been able to reassign over a thousand state employees to new tasks um, related to the pandemic and to beef up our pandemic response. We've also been able to redeploy across agencies uh, about 400 employees. Um, and a lot of that response has been used uh, to work in new ways and, and new collaborations with other jurisdictions of government to ensure that our response is statewide. Um, so, I, I certainly agree with the need to always maintain that preparedness. Um, and I think that our state workforce has, has done a really good job. Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Batson. Senator Coran. Uh, I'll be brief. And, and thank you, Ms. Batson and uh, Commissioner Batson. The, uh, yeah, never, never do I mean to diminish any of our workforce. I know there's extraordinary people and grossly underpaid for the value in which they provide um, in the public sector. But if we don't have the value proposition to ensure every position is, is uh, performing at the high, highest level for their own, for the benefit and the value of the workforce of each person at every level, um, we won't get to the point where all citizens believe they're getting great value. And that's been my entire mission here. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Coran. Uh, Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Coran used the, the phrase producing more with less or doing more with less. And I guess I've heard that uh, over time, many times. Uh, I'm not sure that law enforcement, healthcare educators would necessarily agree with that. But you also made the comment just now about the value of the work workforce for each position. You also made a comment about productivity, uh, productivity has gone down uh, by adding with added personnel. I'm just wondering if you have any data to support those comments. 
Senator Coran. Ma Madam Chair, um, actually, uh, Senator Clausen, uh, with my 38 years and 18 of those being in the Minnesota Department of Revenue, um, the continued experience of the addition or the, um, the kind of the odd incentive that as with the production reduces is, is drops in any particular unit, whether you're in a, in a task oriented process, um, if we fail, there's no corrective action that causes us to re-engineer that business process. And ultimately what actually happens over and over and over again um, is that we add more resources and we add more people and the outcomes don't increase or improve. You could tie that into MinLARS. I could show you MinLARS wasn't a failure. MinLARS was a result of uh, 10 years, hundreds of millions of dollars of spent dollars, wasn't a technology problem. It was a business process knowledge problem. And in this case, we rewarded the system again by having to spend another $100 million to, to deploy a system that, that should have worked the first time it was turned on. And that system alone, turning it on, was missing about 50% of the capabilities of the prior system. The only difference between that system and those all others, the 2,800 systems we have, is that had a publicly exposed component to it, and you recognized what it did. When the rest of government performs at that same level, it's not visible to the average human in under, or the average citizen to understand it. So I've got 38 years of, of proven knowledge and experience at the federal, city, state, county level, that that's how it works because we don't have a naturally, cor naturally occurring corrective action for us to re-examine the business process to ensure the outcomes are at the highest level. One's task oriented. The, the other is Department of Health and Human Services. When it's our children, disabled, and, and our elderly, some of those outcomes are really bad because of that same model. Thank you, Senator Coran. Senator Howe, you did have your hand up, and um, so I'll call on you unless your question or has been I'll answered. Ta I'll take this. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take this conversation offline with uh, Senator Coran. Okay, wonderful. Uh, one of the things you will find, I believe, Senator Coran, that we've experienced that in the private sector, as we've seen during this pandemic, the private sector had to reinvent their businesses many times over again with less resources. Uh, they didn't want it, they didn't ask for it, uh, but they, they took it up and rose to the challenge uh, as best as they could. But I saw them do that time and again. Okay, members, oh, another hand here, great. Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna make a comment that, you know, you, you touched on it, Madam Chair, uh, that in the private sector, you do make more with less. And it comes not because of the, of the folks uh, that are the producers, it's because the board of directors and the leadership demands it. And whether you like it or not, we are the leadership of the state of Minnesota. We are the Senate. We are part of the branches of government that is the leadership that should be demanding that we do more with less. And to just throw up your hands and say, well, gee whiz, we can't possibly do that. You know, that's, you're, you're capitulating to, to uh, a, a, a position that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it really doesn't. I mean, law enforcement and education, they're finding new ways every day to teach. They're finding new ways every day to police to get more done with less. And I trust that they will find and be innovators and come to us with legislation saying, can we have this? Can we do this to make their lives more productive? So to just throw your hands up and say, well, we as the board of directors of the state of Minnesota just can't do this because we just can't possibly do more with less is just ludicrous. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Osmick. Um, um, okay, Senator Carlson, I see your hand is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to ask uh, Ms. Batson uh, a question about uh, our stats here in Minnesota. Can you can you offhand it? I'm, I'm hoping I'm not catching you uh, off guard, but can you tell me what our rank is on public employees uh, versus population, and also how that those stats have changed in the last few years, whether we're on the way up or are we on the way down? Uh, and I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I'm kind of thinking in my, my 
mind here that we did have stats that show that Minnesotans are getting a, a, a good deal on cost of government compared to other states. You can tell Ms. me Batson. more information on that. Ms. Batson. Madam Chair, uh, Senator, uh, I, I was thinking the same thing as I was listening to this uh, conversation. Unfortunately, I did not bring that data with me and I think it's critical that you have good data um, I'm also of the, the same impression uh, that Minnesota provides a good value when looking at cost of government. So our team would be very happy to get that data for you. Thank you, Ms. Bautzen. Thank you. Uh, Senator Coran. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator Carlson and Ms. Batson. I, I think that's great. Um, what we get, what we always get very mired in is government comparing government to itself. And, and frankly, I don't care what the rankings are nationally. I care what our citizens say. And if our citizens claim that, my God, it's amazing, that's what I measure, and they're not saying that. And so government hasn't, uh, you know, it, it, and I guess the, the comparison to the private sector, I wanna clarify as well that um, Senator Osmond brought up a great point. The difference in the private sector is those, those private sector businesses are driven based on competition, and there's a P&L that drives that, and there's, comp there, you know, they can go elsewhere. Our citizens only have one government and they don't have a choice. And so the P&L is what traditionally drives the rapid change in behavior and, and a continuous uh, life cycle improvement. We don't have the P&L and, and don't get me wrong, I understand that, but that doesn't mean we can't implement the business process to replicate that type of drive and, and to make sure that we have corrective action when we fail or the outcomes are poor. And our outcomes are life and death in many cases. And so. Ms. Batson, I would love to walk beside you as I've made the promise to every single commissioner at MMB and at hopes at some point the governor would come to the table because in order for him to get more of what he wants and everybody to feel great value, we really do have to engage in that process of, of retraining and, and attachment to the life cycle and live by the decisions you make yourselves or we can't continue or we won't improve the outcomes of our systems delivery, the health outcomes of health and human services and prove great value to the citizens. That's truly the goal. So. Thank you, Senator Cran. Uh, Senator Osmick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, just sitting at my desk, uh, I was able to find the statistics that were just referenced by Senator Carlson. Um, Minnesota's, Minnesota ranks someplace in the middle of the pack with about 76 FTEs per 10,000 of population. Uh, one of the worst states, interestingly enough, is the state of South Dakota. They're at 100. Well, that's why that number, ranking us based upon number of FTEs per capita, is a false assumption because there are certain activities, there are certain positions you have to have regardless of the number of people you have in, in your state. And that isn't to say that men, the South Dakota is less efficient. It's just that you're, you're grasping at a number that is not necessarily transferable across all of the states and doesn't show anything about efficiency. So uh, saying where we rank as far as number of public employees is, is a bit of a false, uh, false flag. Uh, we should just be striving, as I said earlier, to make do with less and do more with less. And I think forcing, as the CEOs of Minnesota, forcing that is in a very important position to take. Thank you very much, Senator Osmick. Uh, by the way, I have some real life examples of my own in regards to uh, being uh, accomplishing that uh, better service and doing it with less. And it seemed a little bit insurmountable at the time, but in the office that I held, that was the challenge of what we had to do. And our staff rose to the challenge and we accomplished that and very proud of that. They were very proud of it as well. And we took care of every single one of them and respectfully in the best way we could, but we also knew uh, things that we had to do. And sometimes uh, we didn't know that there were uh, impact printers with quadruplicate forms that had to be pulled apart and had been done for a long, long time. And uh, all the employees it took to tear them apart and sort them and do all of that and uh, refocused our efforts and using some technology and changed some processes and procedures and uh, worked out really great and gave them higher functioning work instead of just standing there and pulling apart quadruplicate forms. Now, I would suppose that's no longer existing somewhere else, but uh, what other kinds of things that have just been hung on because that's the way we are used to doing it 
is usually the thing and some really good things can happen. Well, members with that, I appreciate all of your comments and the robust discussion. Thank you to our testifiers for being here today. We appreciate that you took the time to be here uh, to get information for us, to share with us your thoughts and your opinions. And uh, that is greatly appreciated. With that, members, we're gonna take action on our last bill on the agenda today. And Senator Coran, you can move your bill center file 299 as amended. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to. There's going to be some great uh, postcards and jokes and <laughs> who knows whatever yet about the perennial. You're muted. <laughs> Senator Madam Kennedy. Chair, um, everybody can see fa everybody's facial expressions far more clearly in video <laughs> than they can in the, in the committee floor. So um, there will be. Um, so I'd like to renew my motion for Senate file uh, 299 be recommended to pass as amended and sent to the general orders. On that motion, members, support. thank you, Senator Grant. On that motion, members, please unmute. And that will proceed to a vote. All those in favor say aye and give a thumbs up. It's helpful to see. Aye. 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 All those opposed? No. All right, motion prevails. Senate file 299 is passed as amended and will be on its way to general orders. Thank you, Senator Coran. And members, with that, we've concluded the business of our agenda today. Please stay tuned. We will be having our hearings next week as scheduled on Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, please stay tuned for information on your uh, email connections or calendars. With that, we are adjourned.